Okay, let's keep reading Rameau's Prince in Exile. Afterlife. Rameau's awoke and shivered. He hoped it was a dream, but he was too scared to open his eyes. What if it wasn't? He opened one eye. He could see nothing. He felt like he wanted to be sick. He opened the other eye. Everything was still black. He couldn't see a thing, but he could smell something. The salty smell of Natron. The stuff that the priests used to preserve bodies before they were mummified. There was also the sharp, sweet smell of juniper oil, which was poured over the body after it was wrapped in linen strips. He was lying on a cold stone table. This is no dream, thought Ramos. His stomach turned somersaults. I'm dead. Someone is about to cut open my body, take out my insides and turn me into a mummy. Ramos heard someone moving. He raised his head. There was a figure in the corner leaning over a lamp. You're awake, said a familiar voice. Hurrah, said Ramos. Did you die too? You're not dead, Highness. But this is a tomb, isn't it? Hariah shook her head, helped Ramos to sit up and gave him some cool water to drink. This is an embalming room beneath the Temple of Mart, said the old woman. Ramos was confused. His mind was still foggy. He was lying on the stone table made especially for embalming dead people. He could see the channels that were meant to carry away the blood when the dead bodies were cut open with a sharp flint. What am I doing in an embalming room if I'm not dead, thought Ramos. He drank the water and then immediately vomited up again. Hariah stroked his back the way she always did when he was sick. What's happening to me, Hariah? Ramos was trying to remember what had happened. Something frightening, something so bad his brain was keeping it hidden from him. Kenneben came into the room and bowed to the prince. I hope you're feeling better, Highness, he said. Ramos suddenly remembered the tutor's strong grip and the taste of the bitter liquid. He looked up, looked from his tutor to his nanny, the two people he had trusted most in the world. You poisoned me, he said, trying to get his feet, get to his feet. Kenneben knelt at the prince's feet. No, Highness, I wish you nothing but health and long life. Someone tried to poison you, my prince, but they failed, thank Amun. Hariah sat next to Ramos and started to tell him a story. She had told him many stories in his life, but never one that scared him like this one. As soon as Queen Mutnofret came to the palace, I knew she was trouble, the nanny said. I never liked her. When your dear mother died, Mutnofret made sure that she became Pharaoh's favourite wife. Then your half-brother was born, and I guessed what her plan was. She wanted her own son to be the next pharaoh. I found a written spell in an amulet around her brat's neck. I took that the spell to Kenneben to find out what it meant. Kenneben continued the story. It was a spell to bring death to you and your royal brothers, Highness. I don't believe peasant magic can kill a royal heir, but when your brother Prince Vodmos died, I wondered if it really was an accident. When Prince Amenemos died as well, I was convinced that someone was killing the princes and that you would be next. Since then, we have watched you day and night, Hariah said with tears in her eyes. Poisonings were what was what we feared most. That's why we tested all your food on the monkey first. All the inexplicable things started to make sense. Poor Topi, said Ramos. In many ways, the monkey had been his best friend. Ramos took another sip of water. This time it stayed down. Then he tried a mouthful of bread. When can I go back to the palace? We must send messages to my father. I don't think that's wise, Highness. Why not? If Pharaoh knows what she's done, he'll imprison Queen Mutnafret. We can't prove it was her. She'll just deny it. Pharaoh is very fond of her, and she has a way of making things sound convincing. Ramos's head ached. He was finding it difficult to understand what his tutor and nanny were planning. But what am I to do? I can't stay here unless you think I should become an umbama. Ramos laughed, despite the pain in his head and his somersaulting stomach. The idea of him having to work for a living was ridiculous. Kenneben and Hariah didn't laugh, though. They didn't even smile. If you're to become Pharaoh, Highness, you must stay hidden until you are old enough to claim the throne. Hidden? You mean imprisoned? No, Highness. We have given this a lot of thought. There are so few people in the palace whom we can rely, really trust. The vizier is more than likely on the side of the queen. He is a powerful man who no one dares to defy. Every servant and slave will be a potential enemy. 
It's too dangerous for you to stay in the palace. We could hide you somewhere in a different town, even a different country. Ramos shuddered at the thought of leaving Egypt. Wherever you go, eventually word will get back to the vizier and the queen. The only way you'll be safe is if, is if everyone thinks you're dead. The potion you drank, Highness, gave you a, the, every appearance of being dead. Pariah wept again at the memory. When you were taken away from emba embalming, I managed to switch your body with that of a peasant boy about your age, who had just died of an illness. Does my father think I am dead? My sister? Yes, it was the only way to ensure your safety. But surely you don't expect me to stay here, Rameau said, indicating the dusty, smelly room. No, Highness, of course not, said Kenneben. What I have in mind is that you disguise yourself as an apprentice scribe. An apprentice scribe? Yes, Highness, said Hariah, you won't need to do physical work, and you have the scribal skills. I have found a scribe looking for an apprentice. He and his wife have no children. They are looking for a boy to train to take the scribe's place. I won't become a scribe, shouted Ramos. I'm Pharaoh's son, the heir to the throne of Egypt. I won't do it. You can't make me. Chapter 4. The Edge of the World Ramos leaned over the side of the papyrus boat and trailed his hand in the blue river water. An old man was rowing the boat across the Nile, the lifeblood of Egypt. Without the river, Egypt would not exist. He knew that. The river gave Egyptians water to drink and to make their crops grow. Each year in the season of Arquette, the river turned green and flooded. The, <clears throat> the fields disappeared beneath its waters. When the water receded and the Nile shrank back to its normal size, a layer of black silt was left over all the farmland. It was a gift from the gods that made fruit and vegetables grow fat and full of flavour. Ramos knew these things because Kenneben had taught him. He cupped some of the Nile water in his hand and drank it. The small boat reached the western bank of the river and Ramos climbed out. He was wearing a coarse tunic over his kilt. He still had his favourite red leather sandals though. He had insisted on keeping them. The path from the river skirted around the palace. Behind those walls, which were almost close enough to touch, were his sister, his tutor and his dear nanny. Maybe his father was also there, just returned from a triumphant campaign in Kush, but as well as the people who loved him, there were also people who wished him dead. The queen, the vizier and the brat prince, prince Tuthmosis. Ramos walked on without stopping. There was no one to farewell him as he walked away from the places that were familiar to him. The day before, Hariah and Kenneben had sneaked away from the palace at different times to say goodbye to him. It was too risky for, for him to be seen with either of them, and they didn't trust anyone to guide him. Instead, Kenneben had drawn a map for the prince on a small sheet of papyrus. Ramos walked along a path between a canal and fields of wheat and vegetables. The path was shaded by date palms. Peasant farmers went about their daily business without even glancing at him. The path zigzagged past fig trees and grapevines. A man lifted water from a canal and poured it into his fields using a device and a, with a leather bucket at the end of a counterbalanced pole. He carefully watered each melon vine and every onion plant. Ramos breathed in the moist air laden with the heavy smell of ripe fruit, lotus flowers and animal dung. Then the fields ended abruptly as if someone had drawn a line in, in the earth. There were no more irrigation canals. The desert began just as suddenly as the fields had ended, and the path immediately changed from a smooth, well-travelled roadway to a rough, sandy track with no trees to shade it. The familiar smells of the Egypt he knew faded and the hot, dry, smellless air of the desert filled his nostrils. Ramos had never walked in the desert before. It was a dangerous place inhabited only by barbarians, sand dwellers and the dead. The path started to climb. On either side, there was nothing but hot sand, apart from the rock that Ramos managed to fall headlong over. He picked it up the rock and threw it angrily down the cliff. It skipped and bounced down the rock face. If Ramos had been in the palace, he would have blamed the servant for leaving something in his way for him to fall over. He would have yelled abuse at the servant and that would have made him feel better. Ramos watched the rock smash into a dozen pieces when it hit the bottom. It made him feel worse. 
Rameau sat in the sand and had to concentrate hard to stop himself crying. Normally, if he so much as knocked his knee against a stool, three servants would have been at his side to see if he needed attention. A priest would have been called to say a prayer for him. There he was, sprawled in the dirt, and no one came to help him. He was alone for the first time in his life. The harsh sun burned the back of his neck. Ramos looked up at the path that rose steeply in front of him. He got to his feet and walked on. He had a long way to go. The hill turned into a steep cliff, and the path zigzagged back and forth sharply in order to find a way up. Jagged stones dug into his sandals as he climbed. Ramos adjusted the bag on his shoulder. It was a small bag made of woven reeds, the sort that peasants carried their food to their food to the fields in. Yet, at that moment, the simple bag contained all Ramos's possessions. He reached the top of the cliff and sat down, panting. He looked back the way he had come, shading his eyes from the sun. In the distance, he could see the glittering ribbon of the Nile with a stripe of green on each side. He was shocked to see what a thin strip of fertility Egypt was, clinging to the edges of the Nile. The hostile desert beyond stretched as far as the eye could see on either side of it. At the river's edge, he could just make out the whitewashed walls of the palace. On the, on the other side was the sprawling city and the temple complex, with its flags flying and its gold glinting in the sunlight. That was where he had spent the last two weeks hidden in the basement room. He turned away from the Nile, away from the land he had known all his life, walked over the crest of the hill and down into the valley. Ramos couldn't imagine why the desert was called the Red Land, when it all seemed to be a dirty yellow colour. The slope below him was covered in sharp rocks and flints where a cliff had long ago collapsed. He could just make out a mud brick village on the valley floor the same colour as the desert hills around it. If he hadn't been looking for it, he might not have even seen the village. From a distance, it could easily have been a natural feature shaped by the winds. There was no green, no gold, no sign of life. This was his new home, the village of the tomb makers. Over the next hill, he knew, was the great place, the valley that his father had chosen for his tomb and for the tombs of future pharaohs. It was a special place, a place sacred to the gods, where Pharaoh hoped his tomb would be safe from tomb robbers. Ramos had refused to leave the city at first. As a prince, he was used to getting his own way. But the more he'd thought about it, the more he knew Hariah and Kenneben were right. He wouldn't be safe in the palace. Queen Mutnafret was a strong-willed and powerful woman who was feared by servants and officials alike. Eventually, Ramos had agreed to their plan. He would live secretly as an apprentice scribe until Kenneben and Hariah could find proof of Queen Mutnafret's treachery against him and his brothers. They would seek out the people who had provided the poison, the ones who had rigged his brother's chariot accident, and buy the truth with gold. It would be no more than six months, they said. Kenneben had found a scribe called Punb, Punib, in the tomb maker's village who was looking for a boy to take as an apprentice. The scribe had had a local boy in mind for the job, but a large sum of gold and copper had convinced him that Ramos would be a better choice. Ramos rehearsed his new life story in his head as he walked. He had been born in a distant part of Egypt, far to the south. He was the son of a local official and had been trained to follow in his father's footsteps. A terrible disease had swept the town, though, and both his parents had died. He had miraculously survived and been brought up by an uncle in the city. The uncle had recently died too, leaving him with no one to care for him. Ramos hoped he'd got all the details right. <laughs>